So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Betty Darnell, a member of Louisville Genealogical Society, who will be presenting today, Civil War Raid in Missouri. But let me tell you a little bit about Betty. Uh, Betty was born in Mississippi County, Missouri, near the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. She earned a bachelor's degree uh, in English with a focus on journalism, and if she wasn't such a busy lady, we'd snatch her up for editor of our quarterly, I'm sure. But as you'll hear, she's a very busy lady. Uh, at Nazareth College, she got her degree, which is near Bardstown, Kentucky. She ended up marrying a Louisville boy, and they have spent uh, living in several places in Missouri and Kentucky. She joined the Louisville Genealogical Society after moving back to Kentucky in 1987. And she now lives in Taylorsville, overlooking uh, the Salt River Valley. Beautiful view from where her home is at. Um, I knew Betty with her degree in English and journalism had written many books pertaining to genealogy. So last night I got on WorldCat to see a couple of the books maybe that she had published. Well, did I have a rude awakening? On WorldCat, this would only be the books that are cataloged and put into WorldCat. I found her earliest book she published on WorldCat was 1985. And in the next 35 years, people, this woman has produced at least 55 books on genealogy, court records, deeds, wills, census records, mainly from Bullock County, Spencer County, and also her home county of Mississippi County, Missouri. So I was amazed. Betty, you're an amazing woman. And I have an, it's an honor and a privilege to introduce you today as our speaker on Civil War Raid in Missouri. Betty, it's your time. Thank you, Nancy. Next one. Okay. I grew up, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, I grew up in Southeast Missouri where the star is in Mississippi County, just right next to the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi. Um, we didn't go to St. Louis, the shop that was way too far away. We went to Illinois or to, or to Paducah, Kentucky. Next one. I grew up hearing a family tradition from my grandmother, in 1976, she said that my grandfather, Harrison Shelby Thompson, had slaves during the Civil War. He went to Louisiana with eight slaves. Northerners came with boats and spent three days taking corn, horses, wheat, and everything. From a cousin in 1983, two big northern boats came in with Union soldiers. The soldiers emptied out the grain from great grandpa's warehouse, took all the livestock they could catch. From another cousin in 2007, Thompson had a big corn crib, which was built up on the shore next to the river. It was set up on fallen tree logs so that it could be rolled closer to the riverbank when river boats would load his grain and haul it to market. The Yankee soldiers had seen these grain bins. Next one. There's a peninsula in Missouri, just above the confluence that juts into Illinois. So there's Illinois is on both sides of it. Uh, it was called Dogtooth Bend. It's still called that by the, soldier, the boatmen. It's now called Thompson Bend. It's really fertile land, prim primarily because it floods, floods nearly every year. In the good years, it floods early in the season and it leaves a layer of fine silt on, on the land, which makes it really fertile. In bad years, it comes in June and that destroys the crops. In really bad years, it comes and lays on the ground for a long time and that's caused, leaves sand on the land. And so that really destroys the land. So it's a kind of a gamble that the farmers had to be prepared for. Next one. My great great grandfather Harrison Shelby Thompson was born in 1813 in Cape Girardeau County, Missouri. Uh, someone asked, is it cotton country? No, uh, it, they tried cotton for a while, but it did, didn't do very well. That's usually further south and further west that's cotton country. In 1833, his father died. In 1836, Shelby purchased 240 acres on, in Dogtooth Bend of the Mississippi River in Scott County. In 1840, Shelby married Elizabeth Good. She died in 1843. In 1845, Mississippi County was formed and that included, included Dogtooth Bend. Shelby paid taxes on 360 acres. In 1846, 
Shelby married Hannah Shepard. Those are my ancestors. In 1850, the agricultural census, Shelby reported 275 improved acres and 800 unimproved acres. Next one. These are my great great grandparents, Harrison Shelby Thompson and Hannah Shepard Thompson. Next one. <laughs> Southeast Missouri, the whole of Southeast Missouri is very flat and swampy. It was swampy. In the United States, this in the Swamp Act of 1850, they gave the swamp land to the states to sell. The money was to be used to reclaim and develop the swamps. Missouri received title to about three and a half million acres of swamp land, about 2.4 million acres, acres of it in Southeast Missouri. It's still called Swamp East Missouri occasionally. In 1852, the Missouri legislature transferred nearly all the swamp land to the counties. In 1858, Shelby purchased nearly 2,000 acres in swampland patents at $1.15 an acre. That was in Dogtooth Bend and it's now called Thompson Bend because he owns that, owned about half of it. In 1858, there was another big flood. In 1859, they built a levee in Mississippi County 30 miles long. In 1893, the Walker Plan suggested that 500,000 acres in Southeast Missouri could be reclaimed by a system of levees and ditches. In the early 1900s, there were six long ditches dug over 1,200 miles, draining south to the St. Francis River in Arkansas and to the Mississippi River. Next one. This is our claim to fame. The movie How the West Was Won featured the Erie Canal and they used a drainage ditch in Mississippi County to represent the Erie Canal. So that's the boat they used on one of the ditches. Next one. This is my sister and my brother on the boat that was used in the movie. Next one. Shelby Thompson owned 4,500 acres at, at his death in 19, 1867. His widow Hannah married John Harness and you can see their home, home site in the, in the map right next to Thompson Landing where, at the, where it says Hannah Harness, that's the home site. Next one. The 1860 agricultural census, Shelby reported $15,000 worth of real estate. In the 1860 presidential election, the results in Tiwapiti Township, which included Thompson Bend, Stephen Douglas, Northern Democrat from Illinois, 66 votes, John Breckenridge, Southern De Democrat from Kentucky, 87 votes, John Bell, Constitutional from Tennessee, 101 votes, Abraham Lincoln, Republican from Illinois, one vote. Does that tell you something? Next one. This is the Shelby Thompson home, Shelby and Hannah Thompson home. My grandmother drew this picture in, at, at age 15. I don't know about you, but I couldn't have done that at age 15. Wow. That get, kind of gives you the background. Are there any questions so far? And you know what? I'm looking at your slideshow and can't get to the questions, Betty. So if somebody else out there can field them for her. Uh, yeah, someone says, slow down, please. I know that. <laughs> And Bill posted about the, the video, yes. Um, and I, I, I have let my notes, slow, slow, slow. So next one. Okay, we've already done that one. Next one. In 1861, the Civil War came along. April 12th, the Confederates fire on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. June 16th, Ulysses S. Grant was named commander of the 21st Illinois. August 28th, the District of Southeast Missouri was formed, including the southern tip of Illinois. That was commanded by newly commissioned Brigadier General Grant, who established his headquarters at Cairo, Illinois. September 3rd, Confederate General Polk moved into Kentucky and stretched a huge train, a chain across the river to stop the U.S. gunboats. Next one. This map shows you the general area. You can see Cape at the top, Charleston, where I grew up north of there, and then the uh, Thompson Bend and Carroll, Illinois, where Grant was. And then at the bottom, Belmont in Missouri and Columbus in Kentucky. Next Ooh. one. This is the anchor of the chain that's on display at, at the Columbus State Park in Kentucky. Next one. 
November 7th, 1861 was the Battle of Belmont, the first combat test for Grant, future U Union Army General in Chief. And that was it. He was stationed at Cairo, Illinois. By the way, it's Cairo, not Cairo, and definitely not Cairo. It's Cairo. Cairo, excuse me, just like the Cairo syrup. Uh, Grant went by riverboat to attack the Confederates at Belmont. There was a larger group of Confederates at Columbus, Kentucky. Grant destroyed the camp at Belmont. The Confederates regrouped with reinforcements and artillery fire from Columbus and, and counterattacked. And Grant retreated to Paducah. Both sides claimed victory. Because of that, there were a lot of soldiers in the area. So in 1986, my grandmother died. And we found the paper in her estate. It was a, a letter in, from a lawyer in Charleston who was forwarding a letter from a lawyer in Washington, referring to a claim that the heirs had made for damages done during that raid. It gave you the estate number, the claim number, and the letters essentially said that we need to prove that he was not in favor of secession. We need to prove that his slaves were not used to assist the Confederacy. Under the present ruling of the committee, it will be impossible to have this claim paid unless we secure a fund finding of loyalty. Next one. So I sent off to the National Archives with that claim number and they said they couldn't find the file. So years ago, I read that we pay our, our congressman's salary, so use him when you need him. So I did, I sent to my, sent to my congressman and told him what the problem was. And I got a, 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 a form from the Library of Congress completely filled out. All I had to do was add my check and send it off. And I got back 50 plus pages with lots of depositions, which detailed everything we had grown up hearing. So next one. The claim was for $27,000 of damages. Mm -hmm. Next one. 1902, there were depositions. Mary, Mary Simons, who lived on the Illinois side opposite Thompson's Landing, she saw Union soldiers loading corn on two boats. They tore down fences. They drove hogs, sheep, and cattle onto the boat. W.B. Swank said he knew about Thompson having to leave home on account of the report that federal soldiers were going to hang him. He took his slaves to his brother in Louisiana, moved to Pemiscot County in the winter, and returned to his farm in the summer of 1862. Swank saw the soldiers take corn, hogs, sheep, tear down fence rails for campfires. Next one. This is a list of the property that they claimed. 20,000 bushels of corn, three horses, 20 cattle, 300 hogs, 40 sheep, damage to corn cribs and fences, three tons of fodder for a total of $27,000. Next one. More depositions. James S. Reardon, who lived in Carroll, he was Colonel of the 29th Illinois. He was called to detail two companies to Thompson's Landing to get corn in two boats, the Alex Scott and one other one. Next one. This is the Alex Scott. Notice the soldiers on the levee with stacked rifles and, the, and more soldiers on the boat. You can see there were a lot of soldiers in that area. Next one. So the House of Representatives in 1902 introduced a bill, the Secretary of Treasurer to, Treasury to pay the heirs $27,000. They referred that to the Committee on War Claims. In May 1902, the Committee on War Claims said the committee has no opportunity of subjecting witnesses to a cross-examination. The claim should be referred to the Court of Claims where depositions can be taken. Next one. More depositions in September at Charleston. James Smith said under the laws of Illinois, the slaves would be free when they entered that state. So Thompson took his slaves south and hired them out. Thompson had no sons or brothers in the Confederate service. Eli Brown said Thompson had something like a thousand acres in cultivation. His corn was stored in cribs and pens. The pens were covered with board roofs. He had the woods full of hogs. He probably had two years of corn stored. Mary Simons again said, Thompson said Confederate soldiers had taken about 20 head of horses before the Union raid. Thompson was taken prisoner and put in the guardhouse at Cairo. He was kept a week or 10 days. There was no charge found against him and they let him go. 
I have not been able to document that. I would like to. Next one. Depositions, W.B. Swank, who was Thompson's nephew, said that he was at Thompson's about the time the soldiers completed hauling the car off. The Thompsons were all gone. I had a second cousin among the Union soldiers, Howard Thompson of Howard County, Missouri, under Colonel Logan. I wonder if he was there. I, I, I always wondered about that, but I don't know. Soldiers tore up black walnut rail fences along the half mile lane from the house to the woods. Joe Watkins said, I knew Thompson's sons, Albert, Cyrus, Willie, and Americus. Americus died in our house. The Thompsons stayed at my uncle's house, Mr. Kirkpatrick, three or four years during the war. Kirkpatrick had two sons in the Confederate Army. Whoops. Next one. More depositions. L.D. Hartwell, an Illinois lawyer who had served as a member of the 31st Illinois, was stationed at Cairo in 1861 and 1862. He said that some of the soldiers thought the farm belonged to Jeff Thompson, who was commander of Confederate forces in Southeast Missouri. Actually, he was not related. Sam Newcomb, Thompson's son-in-law and my great-grandfather, said that his wife inherited the homestead and the landing. Next one. Sometimes a clue just pops up. A cousin read a book about the officers of the Union Army stationed at Cairo. Next one. The title of the book was Major General John Alexander McClernand, Politician in Uniform by Richard L. Kuyper in 1999. On page 36, it said a reconnaissance by Colonel John Logan, the important Illinois congressman, had revealed that Shelby Thompson had stocked a considerable amount of corn and cordwood on his farm. On September 30th, McClernand ordered Logan to seize goods of value to the Confederacy at Thompson's farm. And it gave the references. Uh, letters in box four at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in Springfield. So you know what I did next. Next one. <laughs> Some of the letters, Colonel John Logan from Illinois uh, to, to, at Camp McClernand to General John McClernand in September 1861. I detailed 200 infantry and 25 cavalry on the steamer DA January. We went to the farm of Shelby Thompson, represented as a strong secessionist and now in Louisiana. We took some, there were some five or 6,000 bushels of corn cribbed and about 600 acres standing and growing a large quantity of cordwood. Next one. McClernand wrote to Logan, ordering him to go on board a steamer to go to Thompson's Landing and take on board all the corn, livestock, and cordwood belonging to Shelby Thompson. Next one. Logan reported to McClernand on 30 September, Lieutenant Colonel White embarked on the steamer Rob Roy at Cairo at 10 a.m arrived at the farm of Shelby Thompson at six, prepared a road to allow teams and wagons to be put on shore, camped on the farm for the night. I embarked on the steamer Memphis at 10 p.m., arrived at 2 a.m. the same night, caused the Rob Roy to return to Cairo. Next one. On the morning of the second, we commenced loading corn and wood on board the Memphis. Lieutenant Colonel White report, returned on board the Alex Scott with seven wagons and teams. Those must have been awfully big boats. Worked until nine o'clock at night, started for Carroll at 11. Dense fog, had to tie up overnight. We arrived at Carroll at 6 a.m. Next one. On board the Memphis, we had about 7,000 bushels of corn in the ear and sacked some 16 cords of wood. We killed some 15 head of hogs and used as we were out of meat and were compelled to do so. On the farm, there are yet remaining some 2,000 bushels of corn in cribs. I did a little research. 9,000 bushels of corn would fill about five of those huge steel, steel silos you see on farms now. So that was a lot of corn. Mm -hmm. Next one. Shelby Thompson died November 4th, 1867, leaving three children, Albert, Maddie, and Laura. 10 of their children died before reaching age 20. Albert and Maddie sold their shares of the estate. Laura's L. heirs still farm her share. Next one. So the takeaway are to follow those clues and let your cousins know what you're doing. A lot of times they may not be interested in family history, but they may read something about history or see something on TV and relay that information to you just in case it might be something you're interested in. Next one. 
So you're wondering, which side was he really on? Next one. This is his daughter, my great-grandmother. Her name was Laura Verina Davis Thompson. She was very proud of that name. She always signed her, her initials LBDT. So anybody know who Verina Davis was? Next one. She was the first lady of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. so I kind of think which side he was on. <laughs> Next one. Those are my references. Do you have any questions for me? That was fantastic research. Thank you. Yes. Good job, Betty. Patricia Meyer mentioned that they also have a piece of the chain for a display at Columbus Park and that, the, that they found in the river. And it is huge. Yes, it is. So Betty, on those documents that you sent to the National Archives, was it? You got the 50 page document back? Yeah. Um, what led you to, to uh, apply for that? How did you, I, I missed kind of, how did you know about that? The, the, book, the book that I, on McLernand, it, it footnotes, footnoted that those letters came from the, the library there in Illinois. Right. So oh, oh, the documents originally. No, that was that was the claim. Um, the claim that we had that I, I sent for the sent for the claim, and, and it included all of that. All those depositions. Okay. Betty, well, you no. Know, uh, this is Linda Keekeffer. Yes. Um, I. You, you yes, were saying that Laura Vernia. Verina, Laura Verina Davis Thompson. That was my great grand great grandmother. Your great grandmother, and she was married to the Confederate leader Jeff Davis. No, 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 no. Your name. She says. was. She was named after Verina Davis, Jeff Davis. That Jeff Davison's wife. Oh, okay. Yeah, that went really quick. I was trying to figure that out. <laughs> and someone asked, did, did the family get any money? No, the case was dropped, I suspect, because they could not prove that he was pro -Southern, uh, not pro-Southern. <laughs> Does the family own part of that farm? Is it still in your family? Yes, yes. Wow. Probably the, about the top half of that is still owned by my, my cousins and and uh, other relatives, yeah. Okay. Uh, Betty. I, I, I did not have a handout. Uh, Betty, this is Janet Boffman. <laughs> Excuse me. I just finished reading a book called Enemy Women by Paulette Giles, who also wrote uh, the one that everybody is talking about that Tom Hanks is going to be in. She wrote a, and the enemy women is about a woman whose family owned land in Missouri during the Civil War. Basically, what she has done has used part of her family history and uh, made a novel on it. And she talks about the uh, North and South going through that area. And it, uh, for those of those who might be interested in it, it's very interesting. I didn't realize how contentious the Civil War was in Missouri. It's, it, you know, it's an, a part of the Civil War that we don't hear about. There was a large battle over in southwestern Missouri, and I'm Wilson Wilson something I've forgotten the name of it, but uh, yeah, the, most of the, and in my area was was bushwhacking and civil or Confederate wannabes that were just taking advantage of whatever they could. Betty, that was a great uh, program. I really enjoyed all your maps, and if we could have looked at them a little longer, it would have been better. <laughs> Can you, tell I like, can you tell I like maps? <laughs> <laughs> but but it's interesting uh, to see all the detail that you did, and there there was, uh, and I love the picture that you, was it your great grandmother or your great great grandmother that drew it? My great grandmother was named Laura Verina Davis Thompson. 
No, I mean the one that drew the picture. Of the house. Of the house. Oh, that was my grandmother, yes, at it's age 15. Well, that, yeah. was gr that was great. That was a beautiful drawing. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Any other questions for Betty? Well, Betty, you did Betty. Uh, you okay. had you had said that, uh, or on the slide, it said ten of the children of his children died before the age of twenty. Was that mostly due to disease or what? I, I don't know. Some of them were very young. Some of them were in their teens. I don't know. Hmm. So only it may have been part of the swamp East Missouri. You know. Yeah. They had, yeah, so only three survived. Right. Okay, and which which line of the family now lives on that property? You said about a third of the property um, by your cousins. There's which no one living on the property. They they made everybody get out of the property because it out of the out of the bend because it floods. Oh, um, okay. I have I have Buku cousins living just north of Charleston where I grew up. Okay, north of Charleston. They, they, they farm that land. Yeah. So Betty, do you have family in Missouri that fought on both sides or they would have all been Confederate? <laughs> I haven't, well, I do have some on both sides. Yeah, um, I thought, I don't have anybody on that, on the rolling line that, or the Thompson line that, that actually served in the war. Okay. Oh, really? Because he didn't have any sons that served, right? He only had those, yeah. One, the one son was all that lived to be an adult. Mm. Um, this is Linda again. Um, somebody had posted something real quick and I didn't get to write it all down about the National Archives hub, was it? Can they put that back up there? I don't know who it was. It, it was it's it, still it, on there if you look at the chat. Somebody. Go to the chat, Linda, and scroll it and you'll get to it. Okay. Scroll backwards. All right. Any other questions for Betty? Well, Betty, you did a good job uh, recovering there. It's not easy to have technical problems and then come back and be calm and go slow through your presentation. I don't, I don't think I went very slow. <laughs> okay, totally understandable. But thank you so much for sharing with us and thank you everybody for joining us. And check our website, KYLGS, for our upcoming programs and workshops. And we'd love to see you all back here again. Thank you.